Hello and welcome to week 9 of PubH 610. Today we will discuss ethics in public health. The learning objectives for this week are to have an improved understanding of ethics, to appreciate what constitutes ethical behavior, to apply the five theoretical standards or approaches, and to translate ethical values into principles of behavior. And then lastly, we will discuss um, medical ethics specifically. So there are two different theoretical models for making ethical decisions, deontology and tele teleology. The first deontology is based on absolutes, absolutes. Many religions teach that the will of God is absolute and God provides instructions for living. And these instructions give sufficient guidance for all situations and are not debatable. And under this theoretical model, appropriate actions are expected and imposed and rules are not subject to discussion, interpretation, or violation. And per personal satisfaction is not considered. Deontology fails to resolve competing rights of individuals or agencies because of its non-compromising aspects. And deontology breaks down when rights or interests of third parties are considered. Deontology provides no solutions to questions such as, should the good of an agency be put ahead of the good of a community? Or does a public health agency have a duty to volunteer workers? On the other hand, Teleology seeks balance and harmony. Moral goodness is a subordinate to achieving balance. And moral rules or absolutes are not required and they're not deemed useful under this theoretical model. This is more utilitarian thinking, which seeks the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And teleological correctness is determined by the extent of utility in outcomes and final results. When alternatives, competing demands, or conflicting choices are available, the most correct outcome with the greatest net gain for the greatest number of people is chosen. And as I mentioned, utilitarian thinking is accepted by individuals that make decisions when they're using this type of a theoretical model. And it's relative to population groups. This makes it more applicable for people such as us who are public health practitioners because we're interested in population health. The right or best decision in a the theology, not theology, teleology model is the outcome with the greatest net value. But a real risk is the possibility of overlooking subtle or future factors. Other concerns are that teleological systems are not as objective as they seem. Individuals with differing agendas may assign different values to various components. And teleology allows for the existence of situational ethics. And situational ethics allow for consent that is passive rather than active. And you can think of how that might be problematic in, in public health. Here are five ethical standards or approaches that have been identified. The utilitarian approach, the common good approach, virtue approach,
fairness or justice approach, and finally the rights approach. And we will walk through each of these in the next couple of slides. First, the utilitarian approach, which focuses on the consequences of outcomes of actions or policies, and it places value on the well-being of all persons directly or indirectly affected by the actions taken. This is a straightforward method for deciding on a morally correct course of action. And it is a, there's a direct application of teleology when applied to the, the principle states that the most ethical option will yield the greatest ratio of benefits to harm. Common good, on the other hand, states that living in a community is inherently good, and it pre presents the concept, the concept that members of the community will pursue values and goals that they have in common so that a community comprises individuals whose own good is tied to the good of the whole community. And so, for example, healthcare, safety services, systems of laws, and things like public education are shared and they're considered a common good. But some individuals find that the idea of a common good is inconsistent with contemporary pluralistic societies. The virtue approach focuses on the attitudes, disposition, or character traits that contribute to human development to the greatest extent or degree possible. Applying virtue enables individuals to develop their personal character, and virtuous traits are honesty, truth, courage, faithfulness, etc. Fairness or justice was developed by Aristotle and is concerned with equal treatment for all, and the focus is on how fairly or unfairly actions distribute benefits or burdens on a group. It's concerned with demands that all people receive the same treatment. And if morally relevant differences exist, then exceptions can be made to enable fair treatment. Some examples of a moral rights approach are the right to be told the truth, the right not to be injured, and the right to your privacy. And under this approach, people must be given full knowledge uh, about the outcomes, and they must freely consent to participate in a decision. Ethical decision-making requires a belief in ethics as well as knowing the implications of choices. The ability to evaluate complex and ambiguous and incomplete facts and the skills to implement ethical decision-making effectively. To make sound decisions requires time to think, though and you need to be able to think through the details before acting. Decision makers must think about needed or missing information, and once basic data is assembled, goals can be made and prioritized, and then ethical implications are important when evaluating goals. Options should be considered from the perspective of the stakeholders and beneficiaries of programs, and making changes to improve bad decisions is ethical. There are some concerns with ethics. So sometimes the pressure to make decisions does not confer ethical correctness on hasty or poor decisions, and individuals tend to make errors. They often overestimate the cost of doing the right thing 
and they underestimate the cost of failing to do so. Individuals also have two ethical systems. They have private and they have occupational. And many decent people will, for some reason, feel justified doing things at work that they would not do in their private lives at home. So in this vein, sometimes people will label actions as personal favors. This can be a primary justification for lying or withholding information. And inappropriate behaviors result when cultural, organizational, or occupational misbehaviors are used as norms. And the absence of personal gain can sometimes falsely allow for improper behavior to occur. And individuals that tend to feel like they are overworked or underpaid will often rationalize poor decisions as minor perks to the job. This can lead to serious ethical concerns. How we provide medical care as a society and on an individual basis from a doctor to a patient is based on these four principles of medical ethics. The first is beneficence, which is the obligation of healthcare providers to help people in need. Doctors must care for patients to the best of their ability. Non-maleficence is the duty of healthcare providers to do no harm. And autonomy is the right of patients to make choices regarding their health care. Lastly, justice is the concept of treating everyone in a fair manner. And it also refers to the concept of universal rights to things like food, housing, and education. And lastly, justice means all people should have equal opportunities. So here is a case study. A woman enters the emergency room with stomach pain. She undergoes a CT scan and is diagnosed with an abdominal aortic aneurysm and a weakening in the wall of the aorta, which causes it to stretch and bulge. The physicians inform her that the only way to fix the problem is surgically and that the chances of survival are about 50-50. They also inform her that time is of the essence and that should the aneurysm burst, she would be dead in a few short minutes. The woman is a dancer and she worries that the surgery will leave a scar that will negatively affect her work. Therefore, she refuses any surgical treatment. Even after much pressuring from the physicians, she adamantly refuses surgery. Feeling that the woman's not in her correct state of mind and knowing that time is of the essence, the surgeons decide to perform the procedure without consent. They anesthetize her and surgically repair the aneurysm. She survives and sues the hospital for millions of dollars. So here are some discussion questions I'd like you to think about considering that case. So what are two principles that were in conflict in this case? The first is autonomy, and the second is beneficence. And here in this scenario, beneficence prevailed because the physicians went ahead and they did the surgery anyway. But I'm not sure that the physician's actions can be justified. I mean, is it ever right to take away someone's autonomy? Overall, medical ethics have moved in the direction of prioritizing the principle of autonomy over that of beneficence. Oregon was the first state to pass the Death with Dignity Act in 1997 and six states and Washington, D.C. now have death with dignity statutes shown here. 
Euthanasia advocates stress that it should be allowed as an extension of a person's autonomy. But those who are against euthanasia often say that it can lead to the devaluation of human life, and it can lead to a slippery slope in which the old and disabled will be killed on the whims of healthy people. Death with Dignity Act and euthanasia in general are classic examples of ethics and ethical debates in medicine. How do we distribute benefits and burdens in a society? These are questions related to distributive justice. Who receives what amount of wealth, education, and medical care? Who pays what amount of taxes? And should wealthy people get better health care because they pay more taxes? In most developed countries, health care is seen as a human right, and therefore distributive justice requires that all people will equally receive a reasonable level of medical services based on their need without a regard for their ability to pay. But in the U.S., whether healthcare is a privilege or a right is still being debated, and it is another ethical question that's central to medicine. So Angela and Amy Lakeberg are a famous example of medical ethics. They were Siamese twins born with one heart, and without the surgery, they would surely both die. But with the surgery, one of the twins had less than a 1% chance of survival. So in 1993, a team of 18 physicians spent $1 million performing this surgery to separate them. And Medicaid paid $700 to $1,000 per day, and the hospital underwrote the balance, which wasn't covered. In less than one year, the twin had died, the one surviving twin, that is, after a brief life on a respirator. So I would like you to think about what are the ethics involved in this case, and which medical ethics prevailed? And what do you think about society's claim to distributive justice? And is it right to spend over $1 million to perform a surgery on these twins when they knew very well that the chances of survival for one were so, so slim? And I want to remind you that there aren't right or wrong answers to a lot of these questions that we're posing and thinking about during today's lecture and this week. But my hope is that they'll stimulate some thinking about this and how we should approach medical ethics. So the case of the Lakebergs highlights the ethical questions surrounding distributive justice. And public health leadership and management is full of difficult ethical questions like these. And that's why it's important for you to be familiar with theories which underpin ethics in general, as well as the principles of medical ethics. And more specifically relating to distributive justice, um, thinking about how $1 million, which were spent on that surgery for the twins, could have been used to immunize 10,000 children. In summary, two different theoretical models are used to make ethical decisions. And people's beliefs vary. And sometimes similar decisions made at work and at home have different outcomes. And medical ethics 
are based on the four principles which we discussed today. And lastly, as we discussed in the examples of the Lakeburg twins, there are still many ethical questions around distributive justice and whether we're going to consider healthcare as a right in the United States. That's all for this week. Please check Blackboard for additional readings and other materials.